Hi, glad you could tune into this video. We're making this as a result of the uh, questionnaire we sent out recently. And uh, Jeremy on the Five Pencil Method team and the rest of us would like to do as much as we can to answer your questions. And so I'll let him go ahead and take, uh, uh, take over here and let you know uh, what some of those questions are. Yes, hey Daryl, thank you very much. It's great to be back here with everybody. And uh, yeah, today, as promised, Daryl's going to share some of his hard-learned tips and tricks for photographing and picking the right reference photos for your drawings. Uh, along with drawing fur, that was really a hot topic issue in the survey that we sent out. So we want to shine some light on that situation. And uh, just to recap real quickly, in the last two videos, Daryl shared a lot of awesome information about drawing fur. You know, everything from proper pencil techniques to uh, capturing the unique characteristics of your pet by drawing their their unique markings, the color of their fur, and the patterns. So really great stuff there. If you haven't seen it yet, we'd like to encourage you to go back and watch those. And uh, you can watch those. They are available just to the right of this video, and uh, you can go and watch them anytime you want. So to get us started, I want to read just a little bit, just a quick response, a couple of responses from the survey, uh, just so you can get a sense of what people are feeling. And uh, the first one we have today, they said, the biggest challenge for me is getting a good quality photo to work from. You need to be able to show the form under the hair without ending up with a color book outline. So they're really frustrated with finding that right, that perfect photo. And another person says, I have a cat and would love to draw her, but she will not keep still for a live portrait. She's dark and doesn't photograph well, so I've been drawing from other cat photos. And so it's, it's working to draw from other cat photos, but it sounds like she would really like to draw her own cat and his own personality. So Daryl, I, uh, I know that your father was a photographer and you've done your for fair share of photography over the years. Can you help us understand what we need to look for in a good reference photo? Um, you know, do you have any suggestions for someone taking photos of their pets or animals? And you know, what can they do to get that perfect or reference photo, to get it just right? Well, it's always a challenge. Uh, I think that's probably uh, one of the greatest challenges in uh, doing especially realistic uh, work because you naturally want as much uh, detail as you could possibly get. So lighting is very important. I can appreciate uh, that uh, question about what do I do when my cat's uh, dark. Uh, uh, I don't know how to really adjust for that and explain it to you. I used to go up with my camera, if you have a, a regular a single lens reflex uh, camera, and uh, take an exposure of the cat itself because so often the surroundings may be lighter and then that dark or black cat uh, ends up with absolutely no detail at all. So uh, many times uh, it was really good to be able to go up and take a uh, uh, like, you know, like a meter reading. Now I realize that we're taking with cell phones and all kinds of things nowadays, but I think it probably is uh, uh, good to try to get in as close and avoid the background as much as possible so that it doesn't influence the exposure, uh, the f-stop and whatever. Now uh, uh, again, your camera is going to be uh, very, very influenced by anything that's bright. So uh, let's say if you have a, uh, an outdoor picture and you have the sun behind you or, or in, uh, behind the subject, you're going to want to try and avoid that because it's going to overpower what you're trying to take a picture of and it's going to adjust for that bright light. The same thing is in a room. So you want to uh, you know, try to, uh, again, get an exposure or at least uh, crop in on your animal as much as possible. Uh, so that it doesn't uh, have all this other influence. And if you have a light in your room, make sure that you maybe put that in a different direction or else shoot from a different direction. It's really great for us to know our animals. Um, it's hard to go up and ask them to do certain things unless you have a, a dog that or a cat that is uh, able to do some tricks for you, and that's what you're trying to capture. But obviously, it would be nice if we could go up to the dog or cat and say, you know, hey, now we're going to have a shoot today, and I'd like to be able to capture this kind of an attitude or activity. And so would you please, uh, you know, do a few of those uh, poses for me, some candid shots, 
it, we're, we're never going to have that opportunity. So, you know, it's the same thing with a wildlife photographer. We look at these uh, little movies and it's probably getting easier nowadays because we can plant cameras uh, in places uh, much easier than we used to. But a wildlife photographer is usually uh, compiling or having compiled a video or movie or maybe even a set of pictures in a book. Uh, uh, maybe it's an article or whatever. And these are things that represent uh, photos taken over a long period of time. And uh, they're put together much as we would the videos uh, that we do. Uh, sometimes there's maybe a, a glitch or a faux pas. Uh, and we can go ahead and have the opportunity to edit that out. Uh, and it's the same thing when you have a large selection of photographs. You will pick the ones that actually worked well for you, the ones that captured the uh, personality of your cat, or the ones that had good lighting and detail. Uh, I wouldn't get too far away. Snapshots are bad for that. Uh, you want to, again, try to crop in as close, not only for those uh, influences of the light, but also for the detail you want to capture. Because when I'm asked to do a drawing over the years, uh, when I've been asked, uh, many times uh, they would hand me photographs of either family, friends, and, and, uh, and animals that they were not taking with that in consideration. And here's a, something across the room. It's very low uh, resolution. And, uh, and it's just impossible to get the detail. And yet they saw one of your drawings that you think is one of your best. And they end up by having that expectation that it's going to be uh, like that. So you want to be really careful as to what you, uh, you know, uh, accept as a, uh, uh, a project or an assignment and make sure that you have the best quality material to work with. Uh, this happened to me. Uh, you know, many times, and one in particular was I was doing a uh, cat for uh, a company to see. I didn't realize the potential of the project, and uh, I was working in a new media. I was just starting gouache, and so I ended up by taking uh, my own cat and one that uh, was a candid picture, and I thought really was a, a good pose, and uh, I just went ahead because it was convenient and I had a really great uh, uh, photo of detail. And uh, so I went ahead and did this piece of art and it happened to be to show uh, uh, Friskies, I think it was uh, Cat Food, uh, the company that uh, you know makes all kinds of uh, pet foods. And they just absolutely loved it but decided that they were going to do something else. Well, Perina. I think it was, I uh, saw the photo from my agent and, uh, or saw the piece of work from my agent and they just got all excited and thought, oh, if we could only have you illustrate all of our cat products. And uh, the problem with that is that they wanted to have cat products with cats doing all kinds of different things. And for me, I wanted to be able to zero in a little bit closer. Uh, have something that had a lot more detail in it and also uh, they were candid shots and I couldn't go and ask cats now to pose for me especially with a deadline uh, so uh, this is uh, actually I'll just show you this quick uh, maybe some of you have seen this already uh, this is uh, the picture I'm talking about and it's pretty dark but it had just a mystique and uh, about it and so they thought it was pretty compelling and uh, then they wanted to have a cat uh, maybe on the dock uh, you know at a, uh, a marina or something uh, maybe snagging a fish or a cat playing and trying to capture a butterfly and you know just many different things like this and that becomes impossible you know to just expect your animal or an animal to go ahead and understand that you need that certain shot. So I think like the wildlife photographers uh, so often have happened is they, uh, they go ahead and uh, take as many uh, photographs as they possibly can. And I think that's one of the things that I realized so often I wished that I had taken more pictures of my animals and been prepared, you know, to capture that special, uh, you know, mood or activity 
maybe maybe your cat is playing the piano. Uh, there's all kinds of different things that could happen. And to tell your cat when you really need to to do these things is really unreasonable. Uh, maybe you'll be fortunate, but probably not. And so just keep taking as many pictures as you can and try not to take just one snapshot. Uh, I always like to, whenever I had a photo shoot, whether it's people or pets or even scenes, I would take a lot of photographs. And it's really easy now when we live in this digital age because we don't have to pay for all these to be processed. And we can look through and pick out the ones that we like and seem to work well. And, uh, and then uh, we also have this inventory. Uh, we might see something when we've taken a lot of pictures that worked very well that we weren't even really after. We thought we were, you know, pretty sure we were going to do it from this angle or that. And yet, uh, when we have a large selection, we have a chance to pick out one that's dynamic and uh, doesn't need to be one that somebody else expected, but one that you can see from all your pictures that just has a special something to it. Uh, let me show you just a side note on this. Uh, let me show you this. Uh, cat once again. I took this out of the frame a while ago. I don't know whether you can see it real well, but you'll notice that because this this was a black uh, mat, uh, you'll notice that it's darker along the edge. And why is that? That is because it was in the frame and not getting any light. Now I have this uh, drawing or this uh, painting in a hallway that doesn't get direct light and yet black is very, very fugitive. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they uh, try to simulate black because black is abs actually the absence of color. And uh, so, you know, we, we try to go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, simulate it as best we can. And that's probably because we're putting colors together when actually uh, black is something that is, again, the absence of color. And maybe, who knows, maybe light is actually adding, uh, you know, something to our, uh, our pigments that are on here. They, they used to start out with uh, pigments uh, from, you know, like there's vine black. Uh, I think it was done from burning uh, grape branches and there's lamp black. Now, I didn't even realize this at a, at a certain point. But lamp black is a popular color from, uh, you know, for painting, and that is done from the soot of a of a lamp. Uh, you know, ivory uh, black is done used to be done from ivory. Now they use bones and things like that, and they burn them and create a black. And uh, Mars black is probably one of the more current ones now. They they actually make it synthetically. Uh, if, uh, it's a synthetic iron oxide, I think, and. Uh, so it's very interesting that we have to create black when actually it's the absence of light. And white at the other end of the spectrum is actually the uh, combination of all colors together, which just seems to be kind of mind boggling. But uh, maybe that's why uh, light is so, uh, you know, uh, dominant in our drawings or our uh, photographs. Uh, it pierces darkness. And, uh, and takes over. And uh, naturally, uh, we don't want to have just a blinding uh, white. You'll find that maybe if you're taking pictures of family and things in snow. And, and it just takes a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, you know, shooting, uh, taking photos to find out what you need to do to be able to deal with these contrasting colors. But as far as a candid shot of your uh, cat or your pet, uh, just make sure you never put it off because if you want it on any one certain day, that's probably not going to happen. As far as searching for uh, photos uh, on the internet, you might find something, but I would try to get something with as high a resolution as possible. The, the fine art, and the fine photographs that you used to see in these, what we used to call tabletop or coffee table uh, showcase books, where it had the best of the photography or the best of the art of any one person. And, uh, and these are things that they used to say, well, this was printed with 300 uh, dots per square inch. This was printed with 600 dots per square inch. And basically it's the same thing, except dots have uh, spaces in between them. 
And so the bigger the dot and the more there are in any particular place, it's going to dominate uh, or, you know, give you the idea of what color it is. With, with uh, pixels, there's no spaces in between. And so these are just squares. And so uh, often when some of my students send me work and they send me a very low resolution and then a very small dimensional, you know, photograph, and then you try and enlarge it, that's where you get a, a pixelation, we call it. But if you looked at it closely, it would just be pretty good sized squares. They're noticeable. We don't want them to be noticeable. So when you're taking a uh, picture, try to do it in the largest resolution and don't just quickly uh, reduce it down in size uh, because you think you're saving room or you're going to sacrifice the quality. And when you're looking online, try to find something that is more than the 72 resolution. Uh, that's the uh, pixels per square inch. Uh, and then uh, uh, if it is, uh, then as most of our cameras are shooting 72 uh, uh, resolution, we want to be able to have a big enough dimension that we can change the dimensions and bring it down and it will actually be quite detailed and it'll it'll compress into a very high resolution uh, drawing uh, or you know reference photo so when you're looking for things like that look for something with as much detail as you possibly can get uh, practice doing that with your uh, camera uh, even if you have to set up something maybe who knows let's just say it's a teddy bear or you know I don't care what it is a plant uh, anything in your in your same environment and practice with how much detail and what you're going to need to do. If you're uh, uh, having to take something uh, uh, in a darker room, it's going to take longer to actually, you know, take the picture. Uh, and I'm pretty ignorant about taking pictures with my cell phone, but sometimes it's necessary to get a tripod and 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 make sure that there's no movement because the longer that shutter is open to capture enough light to take the, the uh, photo, uh, there's possibly some movement and that's gonna add blur. You know, that's gonna add something that's gonna be very difficult to see, you know, the, uh, the detail in. And detail is always gonna be an advantage. Sure, you can go ahead and get something uh, a little more general in, in uh, uh, you know, the amount of detail. You can have something that, uh, you know, is much more simplified, and yet if you follow the fundamentals that I put down, you can still have a pretty successful uh, drawing or piece of art uh, because you've addressed some of those very solid principles like uh, clean edges and depth and looking for where light would be getting darker if you could only see in the dark place. A lot of logic can really help your drawing to just be, you know, uh, something that has uh, a, a real uh, impact uh, when people are looking at it and they don't necessarily have to, uh, um, you know, guess or wonder, well, how come they didn't have a detailed photograph? I know it's very intimidating. So when somebody gives you also, they're saying, can I, uh, can I have you do my, uh, my cat? Make sure you're getting good quality stuff or else just don't do it. Otherwise, the last thing you did uh, is often what people are going to remember. And if you're very discouraged about your drawing, it's going to come out. And if it's been very stressful because you can't see it well, that's going to, sh uh, you'll be a, something else that's going to influence uh, the quality of your work. And there's just a lot of things that go into it. So I don't have any magic wand, you know, to uh, sell online here to make sure that everybody can take great photos of pets. But those are something, that's something that we all struggle with. And we all have to figure out how am I going to compensate because there's no real answers, uh, you know, to uh, uh, dealing with an animal that's so uh, active and uh, has a mind of its own, even though it wants to please you. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can scare an animal, too. And it might be the click of a shutter or uh, a bright light or anything like that. And so just continue taking pictures of your animals and uh, and over a period of time, you will have a, an inventory of things that maybe you can uh, draw from, uh, you know. And so I hope that helps a little bit. Um, those are just things that uh, have always been an issue. And uh, I just want to get better and better at giving myself all the advantages that I possibly can. I, uh, I've had many, many artists, whether it be on the community or through other sources, tell me, 
you know, that they they were asked to draw an animal, someone's pet or, or an animal in general, and someone gives them a small printed out cell phone picture and it's blurry, it's from a distance, and you know, they don't feel comfortable drawing it, and that shows in their drawing. And I think your advice to to look for other uh, other such solutions is probably better than just trudging through and drawing it anyway. Yeah, and and uh, and uh, and maybe even set up something that's uh, uh, you know like the black cat situation. Uh, you know, you can come up with something. Maybe it's even a garment or a piece of material or something that's very dark, and see what needs to be done to keep it from just being a flat black. See if you can bring dimension in. You know, play with lighting. That's how a photographer would learn anyway, is trial and error. And so I think some of those things could help you. Well, uh, speaking of cats, uh, we're pretty excited around here because we've been working really hard to put together uh, one of your recent art studio drawing series. And, and while he's uh, telling you about it, here's the, here's the actual cat so he can... We're working right now to put together the Lazy Cat Portrait Series. I don't know if any of you saw the pictures on Facebook or whatnot, but a short time ago, Daryl drew, from start to finish, an entire cat portrait. And uh, it was really, really a great opportunity to, to study fur, drawing fur. I mean, we had a cat covered in fur. And uh, it was also, correct me if I'm wrong, but Daryl, I think it was also our first art studio series where we incorporated color. I think so, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's going to be a great set. It's a, it's a set of six DVDs, 11 lessons, and uh, we, we've heard a lot of great positive feedback from this and uh, seen a lot, of, a lot of learning taking place. And um, like I said, it's almost put together. We've got just probably a f just a few more days to get it all set and ready to go, and uh, we'll be letting you know through email uh, when it's ready. Yeah. And, uh, and it gave us an opportunity to address all the things that we had learned uh, up to this point. And, uh, and yet I realize sometimes when you join the studio class, you, you might feel that you need to jump in on the project at hand. I'd really like to encourage you all to uh, you know, take your time with the fundamentals and the uh, principles because we talked about some of the important things uh, about laying a, a, a subject out. Uh, just like on here, uh, I always like to establish, uh, you know, a vertical and horizontal line, even if it's at a slant, because it gives me an opportunity to maybe get the tilt of a head or see how everything else relates to it. I think I brought that in a little bit yesterday. But in constructing this, we start really paying attention to angles and, uh, you know, where edges are and how we can drop back maybe the part that's past the uh, top of the head and past the side of the face and and pay attention to where the actual markings are and how one angle is going to uh, help us be able to visualize where something else is going to be on our, uh, our basically our grid or our layout. And uh, it's always good to work on the layout uh, and start understanding the proportion. It'll become easier and easier. And even if it takes some time uh, to lay out each uh, drawing, it's worth it because that's one of the first things that people notice or may frustrate you uh, when you're drawing is something is not uh, proportionally right. And so it doesn't capture the subject as well. And, uh, and then all of your hard work in putting detail on something that isn't accurate uh, is is frustrating sometimes and uh, many of you have the ability to do a fabulous job and uh, and you just need some direction and to uh, make sure that you don't race on past some of those very fundamental things so we had a chance to address fur how do we get uh, you know something that isn't just uh, looking like a smeared uh, uh, part of a an image but we have some detail in here uh, we have uh, the opportunity to watch and see the angles of the fur, and uh, those are the same thing we would pay attention to on a face. If somebody had, uh, you know, age lines, uh, you know, or a little corner of a smile, or the twinkle in an eye, or whatever, we want to really find out how can we capture those. On this particular one too, like Jeremy said, it was our opportunity to add some color, and uh, and there's a way that we could do it that makes it very compatible with the uh, with the graphite that we've already learned. 
and also the subject lent itself to this too, but not getting too uh, saturated and gaudy and bright with the color that we added, I think made it very, very, very compatible and a very nice complement to this uh, gray, black and white cat. And even the floor, you know, we can gradually bring up the intensity of our colors or the value and uh, whether it's the eyes or anything and have control so where we know just where to stop so that it has a nice balance to it. Even putting the signature on a drawing, as I mentioned, every time we have a project is really important to uh, have that final capstone to our composition and balance to the picture. Uh, and we we can often put it in absolutely the wrong place and then end up by suffering the consequences. So uh, often what I will do is I will write my name out and I will put it in different places so that I can go ahead and see where would it really complement. It might be at an angle, it might be all kinds of things, but don't just uh, leave things to chance, plan them out and uh, it'll really save you time and give you such a sense of satisfaction when you pull it all together. And uh, that's just uh, some of the things that I think will be incorporated into this uh, series. Uh, it went on for uh, quite some time uh, because we took it slow and took each little thing and just addressed it. And get the, the thought process that I have uh, when I'm drawing on the things I want to try to capture and how best to be able to do that. So anyway, thought I might just share that. Uh, like I said, we're excited to get it out to you and uh, we're almost there and we'll be keeping you updated through email. And, uh, well, there are these last three videos have been a lot of fun, a lot of great information and uh, glad you could help us out. Yeah, it's always good to talk about art. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's a pretty much a part of my life. Maybe it is yours. Maybe you'd like it to be even more so. So I hope these help inspire you so that you can uh, go out there and really do something with it and feel like you can have some fun, even when you may not be at any particular level. So Great, great. And uh, we want to say thank you to all of you for joining and watching these videos. And we really hope they helped. And uh, if they did, and even if they didn't, or if you just want to say something, we really want to hear from you. There's comments just below this video. You can leave us a comment, let us know what you learned, and um, let us know about this specific subject. Did, did what, you, what you heard today, do you feel more confident in taking pictures or, or selecting reference images for your own drawing? Let us know. And, uh, again, thank you, and uh, we'll talk to you later. See you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye.